Hi, I'm Jen Harland. I'm one of the lecturers um, at the Archaeology Institute at the University of the Highlands in Ireland. Um, today I'm going to be talking a bit about some of the animal remains and, and, um, and the bone and the shell that we've been looking at from Scale Farm in Rasa. So I'd like to go through what I've been up to this summer. So obviously we haven't been able to make it to scale to do any digging, um, but it has given us a real opportunity to catch up on some of our post eggs, which means what we do after the excavation, the post excavation. So that includes a lot of um, looking at environmental material. Um, other people are looking at finds, we're cataloging, we're cleaning. Um, we're doing um, as much as we can uh, from our home offices. Um, so this has given us a really good opportunity to really think about what we've been up to at scale um, and to uh, pause to think about the sorts of questions we can ask um, and to get a sense of what, what we've actually excavated. You know, we've been there quite a few years now. In the last couple of years, we've excavated quite a lot of material. So it's been really useful to get it all in one place to look at it. Now, in my case, um, I've been uh, picking up where I've left off with the fishbone identification. So I did it a little bit a few years ago, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and um, I've been using this time to, to catch up with identifications and I've also started looking at shell for the first time. So what I'm going to be doing in this talk um, is uh, introducing you to some of the methods that we use to collect um, bones and shells in the field. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about how we identify this material in the lab, um, in, the, in the home lab at the moment. Um, and I'll, I'll have a bit of an overview about what we know about the fish and the shell so far. Um, I'll go through the questions we can ask of the material, um, and then I'll, I'll put it in context and draw some very tentative conclusions towards the end of this presentation. These pictures illustrate the ways in which we find environmental material and, uh, and collect it. So there's three different ways, um, the first of which is called sampling, where you take a whole earth sample, so you basically, um, as you're excavating, you realize that there's probably some environmental material, we might see bits of bone, um, might see bits of shell, so we take um, a sample, you're basically scooping up everything you see um, and putting it into a bucket or a bag. So the picture on the left shows this process um, of um, taking samples, in this case it's limpet rich midden um, from uh, the upper layers, the, the very recent. Um, you can also see a sieve in that picture as well, so that's a good way of making sure that you're catching a lot of the material. Um, uh, as you excavate. Because sometimes, you know, if it's raining, if you haven't got the right glasses on, it, it is kind of hard to identify stuff. And if it, volunteers are not always up to speed with um, what we want to keep, what we want to throw away. So um, sieving and having a quick look at what you're sieving um, is a really good way as well of finding lots of environmental material. So we've got our sampling, we've got sieving. And now the picture um, top right is one of my boys, Callum. Um, ex excavating um, the very upper layers of the limpet midden um, and there he's using finds trays so he's just putting uh, putting the shells that he finds into the, the finds trays and we're, we regularly put everything we, we find into the finds trays so there's a lot of uh, post-medieval pottery, lots of glazed pottery, um, lots of big chunks of mammals um, and the bigger bits of fish bones but you're not going to find the really tiny fish bones um, by this method because they're just too small it's really hard to to see them. Um, so um, th some of the fish I'll be talking about are really small inshore safe silox and piltox. And you're not really going to get many of those bones just by hand collection. So that's why it's so important that we sample and sieve. Now the other picture here uh, shows a horse skull. Now I include this because this is one I found last summer. Um, it was in the, the rubble of the, um, the post medieval farmstead in Trench 19. Um, and uh, I'll show you some pictures in, in a minute. Um, so this was found um, it's, uh, in beautiful conditions, pretty much entirely intact. Um, so this becomes a small find. Now, most of what we're talking about with the fish and the shells, you know, there's nothing too special about them. They're not going to be officially like a small find. Um, but in this case, this horse skull uh, was pretty important. Um, so it's given us a small finds number and it's located uh, three-dimensionally um, uh, by measuring or by using a... Uh, some sort of surveying device to, to get those 3D coordinates located in space. So those are the, the three methods um, that we use to recover our environmental material. Um, now I'll talk a bit about the, the process of um, sorting and then identifying material. On the tray in front of me, um, 
I have an example of uh, some of the bones that we've been collecting on site. Um, so I'm just going to give you a quick uh, sort of tour of what we find here. Um, so this uh, bag here is from Trench 22 uh, from Complex 371. This is the sort of material that we pick up um, while we're excavating. And this material has been washed uh, by um, some of our team, uh, including a lot of volunteers, um, and then it's been roughly sorted. Now I'm going through it for the first time, um, and so I'm double checking that um, the uh, mammal and the bird and the fish and the shell have all been separated. Um, so this is an example of some of the things we find. So that, that's a really nice example, a nice big jawbone there uh, from a sheep. We have a lot of um, uh, there's a teeth, they survive pretty well. Um, it's really easy to recognize this sort of stuff um, with a good reference collection. Um, now, I'm also picking out these things. These are bits of um, fish bones. These are big cod, uh, and that's a ling. Um, so these are the sorts of things that I'm really looking for and what I'll be uh, talking about in this narrated PowerPoint today. Once all the bone has been sorted into uh, the relevant sort of piles for each specialist, I then start going through um, the fish bones and actually identifying them. So at the moment, I'm doing this in my home lab. Um, you saw uh, all those little boxes in the background in the video. Um, that's my reference collection. So that's taken me many years to make, and it includes all of the common species from around um, uh, northern Britain, um, and includes some freshwater species as well, though that's not so relevant here. Um, I also have a small shell collection too of the common shell, uh, marine mollusks um, that we'd find around here. So what I do is um, I take a bag of bones and I empty them out onto the tray so you can see in the picture, um, and then I use my reference collection to identify what I have in that tray. Um, so initially we're looking to identify the species, um, and then it's body parts, so have we got vertebrae, have we got mouth elements, that sort of thing, and, and element is the term we use to refer to which body part. Um, I also record a size estimation for every bone. Um, and I do this because the size of the, the original size of the fish is a good indication of where it might have been caught. So if we have very small fish, those are probably juveniles, they're probably caught close to the shore. Or if we've got whopping great cod and ling of over a meter long, well then you can start to, um, uh, to ask some questions about the society that was able to fish the, for those really big fish, uh, what sort of boats might they have had, what would their knowledge of the sea have been. So size is a pretty important uh, thing to be recording. Now I also record any evidence of butchery, so it's how they were cutting up the fish, um, and uh, any evidence of injury as well. Um, for the shells, it's a bit more straightforward. Um, it's, it's simply um, species, and then if there is some fragmentation, it's which, uh, which part of the shell is present. Um, there are some archaeological sites that produce some fabulous shell assemblages with, um, with lots of interesting worked shell. We're not really getting that here, but there's still some interesting questions we can ask about the shells. So um, before this summer, I had looked at a little bit of the fishbone, and what I'd looked at um, was the material from the very early uh, seasons of excavation, so from the, the 2015 and 2016 seasons. Um, this is when we didn't have that much of the site open. Um, if you've been to the site, you may remember this test pit we had open. Um, it's on uh, in the big rhubarb patch um, around the far side of the, the standing, um, old, the ruins of the old cottage. Um, heading looking out towards the shore and you can see in the picture there um, so it's a very small test pit um, it got all the way down to Viking levels so we did have um, some steatite found on the bottom um, and a very interesting Norse wall but what I'm mainly focusing on um, or what I focus on up to date has been the material from the the upper layers so as we went um, as we excavated we were taking lots of samples and we were also so a sample is a whole earth unit where you just shovel all the earth um, into a into a bag and then you take it um, back to the, the lab at the college and there it's sieved. So you've got a um, better chance of getting all the small bones there as well. And we're also hand collecting which means if you see a big bone pick it up and put it into a finds tray. So what I looked at prior to this summer um, with these upper layers, they're post-medieval, um, we've got some indication of date, there's some um, lots of glazed ceramics, there's a, a penny as well which gave a good indication of, of date. So I looked at the fish um, from those upper layers 
And what they were telling us is that the inhabitants of that site in the recent past were eating some fish, um, and those fish were mainly small, and they were mainly uh, safe, uh, locally called silox or piltox. Um, these were pretty small, young, juvenile fish. So from that, we know that they're found very close to the shore. So there's no sophisticated knowledge of the sea needed, no big, impressive ocean-going boats or anything like that. You can catch these fish pretty easily from the shore or from small boats. Um, so we can tell from the, the rest of the finds and from what we know of historical sources as well that at this time there's a real focus on agriculture. Um, kelp booms come and go through that time period, making people focus much more on the land rather than on the sea. Um, so they're not fishing that much, but these small fish, these, these little silux and piltox, they really fill a gap. They're available in the early spring when there's not much else available. Um, and they're also really healthy. They haven't got vitamin C in them, but otherwise they're a really good food stuff and they fill a gap when there isn't um, much else available. Here's a, a little bit more information about these really small little saith or silox and peltox. Um, so the picture on the left is a really romanticized view of fishing for these little fish. Um, so you can fish them with a net. Um, so this is one example. You can also um, fish them from small boats with a rod and line. But um, these, these um, nets were pretty common. So here you see people sitting on the right on the rocks of the, the rocky coastline. Um, there's various ways described in ethnographic histories about how people would fish these uh, little fishies. And one way is to um, take some limpets and chew them up a little bit, spit them into the water, and you get a kind of oily sheen appearing on the water. And the little fish will come up to that, and then you can scoop them up in the net. Um, once you've caught them, you can eat them right away, or you can um, dry them over the fire. So the picture bottom right um, shows one of the farm museums um, on mainland Orkney, where they have uh, some of these hung up to dry. Um, they kind of dry and smoke at the same time, and then they, they are pretty easy to, to eat, um, like a, a snack that you can just grab and, and eat quite readily. Um, you see the sticks going through the mouth, um, and what I've found with a lot of the, the bones I've been looking at is that there's actually little butchery marks around um, on some of the mouth bones. Um, and I've observed that at scale. I've also found it at a site called Stacklebury on Edie, where there's, um, it's one of the only really good other comparative sites to look at post-medieval fishing in Orkney. Um, and there there's also little bits of butchery on the mouth, probably because these fish were hung up um, to dry. Um, in the not too recent, uh, uh, not too distant past, um, people used to hang these fish up to dry on the outsides of their houses as well. So people remember them um, being hung up in, like in strom nests um, on a south facing wall, catch a bit of sunlight um, and dry, hang them up to dry. And then they can be stored um, not too long. You, you can't store them for perhaps as long as you could a dried cod, um, but they're still pretty useful. And now the other thing about these little fishies is it's not just the uh, value, the food value of the, the flesh itself, um, but their livers are a really source, valuable source of oil. Um, and that oil could be, um, the, the livers could be taken and boiled up and the oil could then be used for lighting. So that was a, a, another important economic aspect of these little fish. So what I've got out on the tray um, here is a sample uh, from test pit 13, which is um, uh, towards the south of that uh, initial test pit we'd opened up um, uh, really early on in sort of 2015-16. Um, and this is to the south. Um, it's an area where we um, went straight down on some um, midden that was really rich in big fish bones. Um, there's also some bits of uh, carved stone, um, uh, red sandstone. So we're immediately thinking this isn't from the recent past, um, and the fish would appear to confirm that. So I'm just going to tilt this down a little here. Um, so what we're seeing here are some really big fish bones. Um, so I can use uh, my reference collection. So here's a cod um, that was 91 centimeters long. So that's really big. These are quite a bit bigger. So we're probably looking at fish that were about a meter, maybe just over a meter long, um, and we're getting really big um, cod and consistently getting really big cod um, from uh, this area. So uh, none of that focus on small fish here. There's something very different going on. There's a very different economic model, um, a very different uh, method of fishing um, uh, in the, at this time. Okay, here's another uh, one. This is from test pit five. 
uh, which is just slightly to the north of that original um, hole we made in the rhubarb patch. Um, in this one, um, we really don't have any indication of what sort of time period um, this material is from yet, and that's one of the, the limitations at this stage. Um, but the fish remains are pretty interesting. So we haven't got those really big fish, um, but nor do we have the really small. Um, what, we, what we're seeing are some middling sized haddock, the kind of thing that you'd probably see and you you know, your fish and chips, sort of that kind of size. Um, we've also got, um, this is a, a lower jaw, um, from a Sather Pollock, but not a tiny one, um, but one that's pretty big, you know, approaching 80 centimeters. Um, and there's more diversity in um, this material. There's also some bits of some pretty big cod. Um, there's also, um, it's just more of a, a range of material here. So there might be a diversity of fishing methods. There's no one particular specialism. Um, so it would be really interesting to work out what sort of time period we're dealing with. Um, so there's some interesting questions to ask about chronology. So as I said in those little videos, um, I've been looking at the, the fish in the shell from um, the, all the seasons really up to, up to last year. Um, I haven't finished this analysis yet, um, but I've been really surprised by the variety of species and sizes that we've been finding with the fish. Um, so in addition to cod, there's, cod, there's ling, um, there's Satham pollock, um, there's also some flatfish, um, and including some that are really massive. Um, and there's, there's some others, there's like uh, rays as well. Uh, so there's a diversity of species and sizes in there. Um, some of them are really, really spectacularly big, um, which indicates some fishing in deeper water and away from the shore. Um, there's also some from uh, further inshore. Now, as we know, the seas around Rause are pretty powerful. Um, that Einhello uh, sound, um, we see it rushing past as the tide comes and goes and the tidal races um, show just how powerful the sea is around this area. Um, so there's some interesting questions to ask about where people might have been going uh, to get their fish. Um, and uh, one of the other, you know, the, the big question right now is um, what sort of time periods are we dealing with? So um, having established what species are found in wh which test pits and which contexts, um, we can then start to look at things like the pottery, um, the small finds, um, and any uh, any evidence like glass. So we have a fair bit of glass from a site, and that's a useful way of indicating uh, chronologies as well. So we need to, to line up all these, these different specialists to have everything come together so we get a good sense of the chronology. Um, and then we can really start to, to put together uh, the picture about um, who are these people trading with? Where are they getting their, their material from? What sort of food were they eating? There's, there's lots of interesting questions we can ask. Um, in terms of our chronologies, um, I mentioned uh, the contexts that have those really big cod and ling are likely to be earlier. Um, they're probably going to be Viking Age or Late Norse, and we know this by um, the quite considerable quantities of work that's been done on um, on lots of other sites that are Viking Age and Late Norse up in Orkney. So uh, one of those is Koigru, and this is material I looked at for my PhD. So this is Koigru up on Westray, a lovely little Viking Age um, Late Norse settlement. Um, you can go and visit it. Um, you can see the uh, fish middens that are eroding at the coast as well, and you can you can see these big bits of fish um, still eroding into the sea. There's lots of others as well. Like St. Boniface on Papa Westray is an example. Um, so at the, the um, middens that we saw at Koigru um, give a really nice indication of the chronologies for this. So you can see um, in the picture there, um, the lower levels are darker. And what we're getting in there is this, this midden material. It's mixed. There's lots of mammal bone, um, quite a bit of fish. And this is all 9th and 10th centuries. And then in the upper layers, you see all the white flecks in there. That's, that's shell. Um, and what we're seeing in these upper layers, this is 11th through to 14th century. It's really rich in those big cod and ling, like I just showed you. Um, and the shells in there, the shells are all used for bait. So shells are a pretty important uh, part of the fishing story. Um, there's also some mammal and seabirds in there. Um, and the, the picture from Koigru uh, fits in with a much wider picture. Um, it's a trend called the fish event horizon, and I'll talk about that in a second. So the fish event horizon, this is a, a really widespread increase in the consumption of uh, fish, particularly cod and um, elsewhere, it's, the herring is involved as well. And we see this throughout Northwestern Europe. Um, we see it um, particularly from about the year 1000, it lasts for a couple hundred years. Um, so what's going on? Well, Orkney is part of this really big system. Um, and it's a system 
which is driven by uh, the Norse, the Vikings, and they are um, people who are really comfortable on the sea. They know how to uh, cross the oceans. Um, you know, they get up to, uh, well, they get over to Iceland, um, Greenland. You know, they're really sophisticated on the sea, and they're very comfortable fishing as they go. Um, so it's a maritime culture. Um, they know what they're doing on the sea, and they like to eat uh, fish as they go. So um, after the year 1000, we also get the gradual um, switch to Christianity, and with Christianity comes some dietary requirements. So fish on Friday. How many people remember um, eating uh, fish um, at school dinners on Fridays? Or going out to the chippy on a Friday night? Um, you know, we, we live in a very secular society now, but we still um, have some of those trends continuing. Um, now also fasting on saints days and through Lent. Um, it's big periods of time where good Christians are supposed to avoid eating red meat and they turn to fish instead. Um, it's also from the year 1000 roughly, um, with a bit of lead up to it, there's um, new urban populations and they need to be fed. And one of the things they can be fed on is uh, fish. And the great thing about cod and related species like ling, um, haddock, is that they can be air dried. So the picture um, on the bottom right there shows modern um, cod being air dried in Arctic Norway. Um, and the picture in the middle there shows uh, salted and dried cod uh, for sale in, in Lisbon today, well, a few years ago. So um, cod is a really good fish for drying. And once it's dried, it will keep for quite a few years. Um, I've heard up to seven years. Um, so you can trade it, you can store it, and you can feed lots of people with it. And we know the conditions in uh, Orkney at that time were pretty good for drying cod. So we see evidence um, of that cod uh, and related species being dried up here. And then um, that product could be used for all sorts of things. So food, obviously, but it could also be traded for other goods, for luxury goods. Um, rents, renders taxes could be paid in this. So the material we're finding from Scale Farm probably fits into this much larger picture. We need to refine the chronologies, um, but it helps that we understand the broader picture. Um, and we understand that through um, the work of lots of archaeological sites you know, up here um, in Northern Scotland, but also in the big urban areas. And we can do uh, what's called isotopic analysis as well to work out where these cod are coming from and then where they're ending up. And there, there's, there's a whole trade network as well um, that we can trace through the isotopes. And that's rather fun. So um, the material from Scale Farm fits into that larger picture quite nicely. So I've just started to look at the marine shells um, this summer. Um, so uh, the story from Scale Farm is uh, it's primarily one of limpets, limpets, and more limpets. So um, we can ask some questions about them. Um, where are people getting them from? Um, and how does their exploitation uh, change through time? So I'll show you in a second how we can ask these questions. Um, and the, the big thing is, um, are people eating these directly or are they using them as bait? Now, you, you can eat limpets. Um, they're not um, perhaps, uh, we, we, you know, they're not ideal. Um, they, uh, they do require a bit of cooking. Um, they're pretty rubbery. Um, they're healthy, but they don't have that many calories. But if you haven't got much else to eat, um, you're going to eat them. And you can also use them, of course, to flavor other foods. Um, where they really come into their own is as bait uh, for uh, catching fish, which are rather more palatable. So um, limpets are uh, gastropods, which are the single-shelled animals. Um, so there's a couple of pictures here, but I'm sure you all know what limpets look like. Um, so they're found on rocky coastlines, and you can catch them catch them. You can, you can harvest them in the intertidal zone. Um, some of the other shells you come across quite frequently um, are the edible uh, periwinkles as well. So that's the middle picture there on the right. Um, there's also the, the really colorful ones. Those are the flat periwinkles, which don't tend to be eaten. Um, so these the edible periwinkles um, are also like limpets found on the, the rocky coastlines. Um, and they're um, a bit more palatable. Um, and we do see them eaten fairly frequently. Um, uh, they pop up at, say, Viking Age sites, um, and uh, people uh, used to eat them until quite recently. Um, the other shell we find pretty commonly are the whelks, um, the picture bottom right there. Now, um, when I say whelk, it's not necessarily what everyone knows as whelk. There's a lot of really localized names for these, uh, which is why I've included the Latin names here. Um, these are a little harder um, to capture. Um, 
but there's quite a bit of meat on them. Some of them can be pretty big, up to about 15 centimeters long. Um, but you do have to go down uh, kind of into the water a little bit to, to get these ones. So um, there is a little bit of variety <laughs> at Scale Farm, but it's mainly a story of limpets. Okay, what we also get are um, bivalves. Um, so the, these are ones that you more recently, that you'd recognize as, um, as edible these days. So oysters are a really nice example of that. Um, uh, cockles, mussels, um, things that we think of as being very nice and palatable. So um, there's a couple of pictures here of common ones. So the, the cockles um, are found around Orkney, um, as are the mussels. Um, so cockles need sandy coastlines, um, and there isn't one of those immediately around Scale Farm, which is probably why there's an absence of these cockles. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, there's also the mussels. Um, so although I haven't found any mussels yet um, from Scale Farm, um, they, they do tend to be quite um, uh, fragile, uh, but their purplish color means that they're pretty easy to identify. Um, so yeah, th these are um, species we recognize as being a bit more palatable. They'd offer a bit of variety to the diet. Um, and if you haven't got much else to eat, these are going to be uh, appreciated. So these are some pictures of Trench 19, um, the big post-medieval farm that we've um, we really opened up quite a lot of last year. And we were really looking forward to getting back into uh, this year. So um, you can see some of the, the structures um, emerging here. Um, now that's me in the, the hat on the right hand side of the, the leftmost picture. Um, behind me there is Chrissy and she's standing in the area where she found a bit of a Viking Age comb uh, last summer. That comb had been around for a while um, and it, it might have been um, backfilled as part of uh, rubble during collapse or as deliberate infilling uh, of that structure. Um, what we're thinking of the chronology is, is what we've mostly excavated so far as post-medieval. Um, now, why I'm talking about this now is on top of that. So what you're seeing there are the rooms that we're starting to, to open up. Um, there was a big area of flagged paving on top of all of this. Um, and that was only about 10 or 15 centimeters below the ground surface. Um, but when we started to peel the turf off, we found a lovely um, midden that was almost entirely composed of limpets. And there were a lot of them. Um, so that's obviously very recent. Um, not mu that much uh, soil had built up on top of it. Um, and we've taken lots of samples from those. Uh, I've, I've started to look at them. Um, this would be an ideal student project. And um, there's some interesting questions we can ask about the, those limpets. Um, and I'll explain those on the next slide. So with the limpets, um, you can ask uh, questions by looking at the shape and the size of limpets about um, where they've come from on the shoreline um, and how intensively they were exploited. So. Um, the pictures on the right show uh, limpets uh, of slightly different shape and size. So um, if the limpets are found higher up in the intertidal zone, they tend to be taller, and a bit more cone shaped. And those lower down in the intertidal zone, they're flatter. So the lower pictures, that those lower down ones. Um, and you can have a look at this by um, simply measuring or even just looking at the limpets. And you can work out, um, once you understand the chronology of a site, you can work out how intensively limpets were exploited. So limpets take a couple of years to grow. Um, they don't live for that long. But um, if you have an area that's intensively exploiting limpets, they tend to get smaller. Um, and you tend to see uh, more of those uh, limpets from low down in the intertidal zone being exploited. So what we can ask questions about is, um, do we see a variation in the shape and size of these limpets? Do we see intensive exploitation? And if we see it, we can then ask the question, why? Um, is it because uh, there was a lot of fishing going on, they need a lot of bait? Um, well, we're not finding those fish bones from the, those, that really recent midden. Um, so could it be that uh, people were actually turning to limpets to eat them? Um, it's possible. And uh, we'll be able to, to get a really tight chronology on this limpet midden um, by looking at the finds. But we also know historically about the clearances that happened in the area. So we could really, um, really go to town on asking you know, what was happening to people's relationship with the land and the sea at that time. Um, did they have enough to eat? Were they having to turn to limpets to eat? Um, or were they engaging in um, intensively uh, getting bait for fishing, which we're not seeing those bones at scale, but were those fish being landed elsewhere? So there's lots of interesting questions we can ask. Um, at this stage, we don't have too many answers yet.
So here's um, some shells that we found last summer. This is from Trench 19. Um, and these are some that I actually excavated. Um, so this is in that um, the area I was just showing you, um, but a bit further down. So we're not looking at the, um, the very recent past. We're probably looking at a few hundred years ago, maybe. Um, so let's have a look. We've got limpets, no surprise there. Um, fairly conical. So we can um, make a guess that some of these are from further down in the intertidal zone. There's some small ones in there as well. Um, but it's not just limpets. Um, so uh, here's a nice uh, edible periwinkle. So there's a few of these in here. Um, so uh, what I'll be doing um, is measuring these um, and working out uh, if there's a change in, in size through time, which would indicate um, over-exploitation. Um, now we've also got... Um, there's a little flat periwinkle. So these don't tend to be eaten. Um, but uh, if anyone's, you know, you, you've been for a walk down on the, the sea, um, people collect these. Uh, kids collect them. And in the, you know, until the very recent past, there were a lot more children around. So I just think about the things my kids bring back every time we go to the sea. Special stones, lots of shells, uh, but adults collect shells as well. And this could have been the same in the past. Um, you do get some shells that are collected because they are pretty objects. So we do need to think about non-dietary uh, purposes um, for collecting shells. Um, so what else have we got? We've got um, quite a lot of limpets here. The condition's pretty good as well, so we'll be able to, um, to measure them pretty well. Um, and, uh, and just, yeah, have a look at the, the other shell species that are present. So there's a, quite a small limpet there, um, as well as these big ones. Um, so there's still quite a bit of work to do, um, and uh, once we understand our chronology, we'll be able to understand shell exploitation a little bit better. Um, there's a few other things you can do with shells as well. You can um, turn them into artifacts, and we're not really seeing much of that um, yet, but um, as we get down further in time, we might be finding some evidence of that at scale. So to, to try to bring this together, um, to some sort of conclusions, um, we are setting ourselves up to be able to ask a number of questions um, about the environmental material from scale. So the, the big question is who is eating what and when were they doing that? Um, so it's about um, looking at how diets change through time. It's about integrating um, the fish with the mammal and the bird. Um, and then there's questions like uh, how did the inhabitants of scale get their fish? What sort of fishing were they doing? What sort of boats might they have had access to? Um, and how did that change through time? Um, same with the shells. Were they just um, exploiting a very local population? Were shells coming in from a bit further afield? Um, so um, we can go some ways to starting to answer some of this stuff. Um, we know in the very recent past, um, people were uh, just fishing from the shore um, for a very small fish. Go a bit further back, um, there's a diversity, and then you go back probably a thousand years or so, and we're just mainly finding the, the deeper water fish. Um, we need to test this hypothesis with some good uh, chronological resolution, though. Um, another question, how are they preparing their fish? Um, what evidence do we have of butchery and preservation? At the moment, um, we're just seeing mostly complete fish, um, a bit of butchery to cut, um, cut them up, maybe into um, pieces, into fillets. Uh, cutting heads off, that sort of thing. We're not seeing any evidence yet of the the Norse style of um, hanging the fish up to dry and then uh, trading the dried product. We're not seeing that yet, um, but we might see that if we excavate more of the Viking Age material. Um, and then we need to look at the, the bigger questions about wider patterns of diet and economy across northern Scotland. Um, and quite a bit has been written about this uh, from the Viking Age and late Norse period. It's not been as extensively written about in an archaeological context for um, the later medieval and post medieval. So this is where Scale Farm can really make an original contribution to our understanding um, of the diet. And although we're getting into the historical period, there's quite a bit written. Um, there isn't that much written about the day to day, about what ordinary people are eating. So that's where archaeology can come in and make a contribution. Um, and we need to look at all of the, the strands of evidence holistically. So um, to uh, conclude, well, we, we've set ourselves up to be able to ask some interesting questions. Um, we're not quite ready to answer them yet. So what's next? Well, working on chronologies. So this summer, we are spending a lot of time um, 
getting caught up with all of our post X, um, getting caught up with finds, with um, uh, finding the right sort of material to be able to send for radiocarbon dating, um, getting uh, suites of material uh, ready to go to specialists, so glass and pottery, different types of artifacts. Um, after this summer, we'll be in a position where we can um, set, uh, send this material to specialists and they'll be able to tell us more information about uh, chronologies, but also about the type of site, how wealthy it was, what sort of trading connections it, it had. Um, so uh, what's next as well is integration with the mammal and bird results. Um, and then uh, what will come next for me anyway is choosing um, some samples of cod for isotopic analysis. Um, there's some, some new techniques that are emerging um, about understanding ocean ecosystems and some of the cod from scale will, will contribute to those studies. Um, and the, the, the last point there, what's next is more excavation. There's so much more we want to do with scale and we want to get back into the field. We want to um, get more about what's happening in Trench 19 with that post-medieval farmstead. We want to take that right down. Um, the depth of archaeology at scale is pretty amazing and um, I'm sure there's a lot more environmental material that we can get out and really have a, have a good go at analyzing. We're many years away from getting our final answers, but you know this, this summer's little pause has um, helped point us in the right direction and has really helped us to, uh, to regroup to understand more about um, what sort of material we have and what questions we can be asking.